Okay, so um, as you see, and as you probably know from the schedule, today is our class on Saadia Gaon. Uh, I write here Saadia Gaon, that would be a, a good spelling, but on the bottom of the page you see his, his name as it is usually spelled, just Sa Saadia, whatever. It's really Saadia, but Saadia, fine, Saadia Gaon. Um, in Arabic, his name was Sa'id ibn Yusuf al-Fayyumi, and in Hebrew, Sa'adiyah ben Yosef Hapitomi. Okay, so he lived in the, around the beginning of the 10th century, which is quite a while ago, right? So um, some things that he writes, we have to keep in mind. I, I taught uh, a, a class on Sa'adiyah Gaon on Sunday mornings in my synagogue, for what, five, six years, or maybe more. And um, we discussed his, uh, and, and of course you have to, um, with his thoughts on, on, on philosophy and on the world, and you always have to remember, this is more than 1100 years ago, or right, this is more than a thousand years ago, this is a long, long time ago. So I have to be um, a little conscious of that because we cannot measure people's insights on what we know today, of course, right? That is called presentism, that's a new term. People who judge people, the people of the past uh, based on the present norms, you cannot do that. You have to see people in their context. But uh, nonetheless, his, uh, his ideas are sometimes astonishingly amazing, to be honest. Okay, we'll go to the first slide. And I will just start reading a bit and then I'll pass it on to the other students, yeah? <clears throat> so, throughout antiquity and beyond, this is a, again, you always start with a historical background. Here's a map, a map of a big part of the Middle East. Throughout antiquity and beyond, there were two ancient Jewish communities, each with their own traditions. One in Israel slash Palestine, so that's on the left, as you see, and one in Babylonia. Babylonia is also called Mesopotamia, it's also called Iraq nowadays, right? And it's between the big rivers, the Euphrates and the Tigris. Right. Those are the main communities. Let's go to the next. One produced what's called the, the Palestinian Talmud, also the Jerusalem Talmud. And uh, scholarly people, unless, uh, especially, well, inside, but mostly outside of the Jewish world, will call it the Palestinian Talmud. Why? Because not not the slightest part of it was written in Jerusalem. So it didn't originate in Jerusalem. So Jerusalem Talmud is not a really accurate term, but if they call it, talk about the Jerusalem Talmud, you know it's the same one as the Palestinian Talmud. And then the other one who was made in Babylonia is the Babylonian Talmud. Everybody calls it that, so that's not a, that's not a problem. Okay, go to the next. So initially, of course, because the temple was there, the land of Israel was there, the Jerusalem was the center of Jewish religion initially. Palestine had been, at least. Palestinian Jewry was the most prestigious one. Everybody looked at that. That's the Holy Land. That's what we should look at. However, because of the Roman Wars and then the oppression that followed, and then the Byzantines came and had all these anti-Jewish laws, that that tradition dwindled. Now, it didn't really disappear, but became less powerful. And then the ba Babylonian tradition became uh, more powerful. So the Palestinian Talmud remained unfinished as a result. It was less studied and was also less commented on, less comments on the Palestinian Talmud. However, the first part of the Talmud, that's the most important one, the Mishnah, that was written, that was written there and by a, uh, the first part of the Talmud is the same. So the, Balast the Palestinian Talmud and the Babylonian Talmud have the same center that they're focused on, the same uh, let's have a core part of the Talmud. It's called the Mishnah, and that's the same in both. Okay, that, but that is written by, a, by not a generation necessarily, but a... Um, generations probably, I should probably, uh, I think, correct this, but scholars, period of scholars, and they're called the Tanaim. That's a, that is a partially a uh, Aramaic word. Aramaic was really 
the most common language um, even among Jews and non, many non-Jews too. The second part of the Talmud, uh, that's the discussions on the Mishnah, is called the Gemara, and that is written by another, well, I, have, I said generation, but it's really, let's say five generations of uh, scholars that are called the Amoraim. Also, partially, it's a mixture, a bit of Hebrew and Aramaic, that word, but um, that's what they're called, the Tanaim and the Amoraim. Now, both Palestine, oh, you know what? Nayeli, maybe you want to read. Both Palestinian and Babylonia had ta Tanaim. Tanaim and Amoraim. And Amoraim. After the Tal Talmud was finished, the next generation was called the Geonim. 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 That's a plural of Gaon. We, 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 I think we came across that word already once, but okay. They were the ones who were believed to have inherited the authority to interpret the Talmud. Yeah, so the Tanaim made the Mishnah, then the Amoraim made, they compiled what's called the Gemara, that's the discussion on the Talmud. Now, then at a certain point, the Talmud is finished. Now you have the next group, the Geoni, what did they do? They had the authority because they are the descendants. It's really the same, the same people, you know, it goes into, in, um, not the same people, but the descendants, basically. Not so much maybe biologically descendants, but the descendants of the schools that they, you know, the schools of uh, scholars. Let's say you have a professor. And in, in this case, these professors are there for their appointed until their death. And then they have students and their students become the professors and theirs. And so this is the one generation goes into the other. And eventually they call them the Goonim because nothing is written anymore in the Talmud, but they have still the authority because they are the students of the original people, the, 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 the authority to interpret the Talmud. All right. Yeah. Both Palestine and Babylonia had Geonim and actually they competed for influence. Yeah, so you had Amoraim people uh, who, uh, who, who were working on the Talmud basically in Palestine and in Babylonia. And therefore these discussions in the two Talmuds are different, right? That makes sense. Now their descendants are Goonim and the people in Palestine say, well, we're the Holy Land. So um, we're really the center of Judaism. We're the land of Israel. So you should listen to us. But the people in Babylonia said, you know what? We have such an old tradition and we have been more uh, constant and we haven't been oppressed. We have constantly been studying. You had all these interruptions. And so we are really a more solid tradition. So no, you have to listen to us, the Babylonians. That's a competition, right? In a way. Good. Ayali? While the Geonim in the land of Israel was hindered and limited by repression, those in Babylonia operated under better circumstances and thus grew in importance. Yeah, so um, it's, it's this is a bit what I, what, I, uh, what I explained. The Babylonian scholars, the Geonim, uh, became more important gradually as a result. Life under the Persians had often been relatively good for the Jews, but Persian rule became increasingly oppressive in the seventh century. So when Ali bin Abi Tal Talib, yeah, very impressive, Nayeli, conquered Mesopotamia, Iraq for the Islam, the Jews were hoping for better times and willing to cooperate. Yeah. Um, so the Persians, we already had the story, how um, the Persians in the end, at certain periods, uh, even before that, were oppressive to the Jews. So now the Arabs come and they conquer it and becomes Islamic. Jews said, okay, maybe it'll be better. You know, these are our cousins and um, let's see, let's work together. Do one more, Nayeli. More the no Muslim rulers wanted to work with the minorities, break the old, Zoroastrian establishment. You really get away with your uh, with your uh, unknown words really well. So I explained before Zoroastrians when we talked about the people of the book that Zoroastrians were also 
considered people of the book. That is the established religion of, of uh, Persia and still a small minority in Iran, but very small. Um, but they had been the state religion of the Persians. So they were in power. And so what, what a new regime wants to do, they want to break the deep states, right? The people who are in place, who are, the, who are in charge of all the administration and they can actually undermine what you want and they can steer what you want. And so he wants to um, replace that gradually. And so they like to work with minorities who also know how the, the country works but are not really the establishment. So who are the other minorities? The minorities are then Jews and Christians. Cassandra, are you? yes, you're there, I see you. Um, maybe you want to read a bit. The Muslim rulers allowed the Jews and other religious minorities to function semi-independently under the Caliph of Baghdad. It's called Khalifa in Hebrew, but in English it's usually called Caliph. Oh. Yeah. Um, they had their own courts, their own charity organizations, their own internal government. The political head of the Jewish community was the Resh Galutha, um, head of the, the diaspora, a direct descendant of King David, yeah. also called Exilat. We did uh, talk about it when we talked about Jews under Islam, so this came up. So it was just interesting, the further you go, the more things come up that are familiar already. Uh, and today that's one of these cases. Uh -huh. Religious guidance and leadership was in the hands of the Geonim, uh, who were the heads of the famous Talmud academies of Babylonia, Iraq. So you had the, the, the secular leaders, as we explained for Jews under Islam, was the Exilarch, and uh, the Geonim were the, the spiritual leaders. There had been two prestigious Talmud academies, one in the town of Surah, the other in Pombadita. Very good, Pumbedita or Pumbedisa. Uh -huh. um, however, both academies moved to Baghdad in the late 9th century. Yeah, so Baghdad was uh, founded by the new, uh, one of the new rulers, and, um, and it became the big center. So people, all, both academies moved there, and they, they lived, they, they functioned side to side. Um, it's, after, it's probably, I, I think it is before most of your time, or at least you were very young, when uh, Saddam Hussein was uh, ousted by the Americans, you were probably quite young because time goes so fast, right? But then there were some, um, some centers who resisted and uh, who fought uh, against America and whatever. And uh, the center of the anti-American forces were in Fallujah. And I write that here, present day Fallujah, because if you know some recent history, Fallujah played a role, but that was the old Pumbedita. Okay. Um, maybe one more, Cassandra. Okay. Um, before the conquest of Islam, the language in which the Geonim wrote had been Aramaic. After the arrival of Islam, they turned to another Semitic language, which became the main vernacular for Jews and others alike, Arabic. However, Jews wrote Arabic with Hebrew letters. Yeah, they've always, uh, wherever you go in the world, the tradition has often been... Um, actually, yeah, uh, to write, to use Hebrew letters, because when people go to school, they learn the Hebrew alphabet, Aleph, Bet, Gimel, and they practice that. So when they, they really, in school, they had their own schools. They didn't really read the, learn the other system. So when they start writing in the language of the land, they use these, these letters. So if you, uh, let's say, you've heard maybe of a language called Yiddish. Yiddish is basically uh, a Jewish dialect of German, and so it just started with regular German written with Hebrew letters. There was a, is a Spanish, uh, type of Spanish that uh, Jews spoke, speak. It's a, it's a Jewish dialect of, and so that's called Ladino, but it's basically nothing more than, um, than Spanish with uh, Hebrew letters. The same with Judeo-Arabic. That's what we call Judeo-Arabic. It's Arabic written by Jews. It is Arabic, but, but with Hebrew letters. Natalie, are you there? When both regions came under Islamic rule, many Jews from Babylonia moved to Israel, bringing with them their Talmud and their traditions. The Babylonian tradition now gained influence in the land of Israel, where both communities existed side by side. So this is a new, unique situation. 
the, the people in Palestine slash Israel and the people in Babylonia had always been under different regimes. So different circumstances. Now they're, they're, they're actually united, so to say, under one Islamic regime, Islamic rule. So they can freely move back and forth. There's no reason uh, to, uh, to keep it separate. Um, there's always an appeal to religious Jews to live in the land of Israel because that's the holy land. That's basically where the whole Torah is centered on, on that land. It's all about bringing the uh, Hebrews to the promised land. And, and that is where they spearheaded a new society thousands of years before uh, of, uh, based on monotheism, based on certain principles of justice, etc. So the ideal is always that we should, the world should be a better place, but this is where we should start, in the land of Israel. So even for, for people in Babylonia, they had a good life there and stuff. That's not the issue. It's probably even uh, economically better usually than Jerusalem or other places, but there's always been an appeal. So people from Babylonia also start living there. But now the it, unique situation is that you used to have in Palestinian, the Palestinian Judaism, and in Babylonian, the Babylonian Judaism. Now you have, go to, to, uh, to Israel, and now you have people from Babylonian descent and from Palestinian descent, <laughs> strange to think of Palestinian Jews because now for some historical recent reason, we talk, think about Palestinian only as non-Jews, Jewish Arabs, but that is very recent. And so historically you could talk about Palestinian Jews. They live side by side in the same land. You could have basically a, uh, a traditional Jew, uh, uh, synagogue in Jerusalem or another town of the land of Israel and that follows the Palestinian tradition. And across the street, the might be a synagogue where the, these ba people from Babylonia and go, and they follow a different tradition. And sometimes it is really different because the, which portion of the Torah they read is entirely different. Babylonians, and most, and actually now all Jews follow Babylonian, Babylonians worn out. All the, everybody, I don't know if there is some some independent thinking groups, but no, hardly. I know there's one group in Israel that tries to bring back the Palestinian old, the old land of Israel tradition, but it's, it's uh, definitely a minority. But we could say to, uh, for the sake of clarity, that all Jews follow the Palestinian tradition now. You read the whole Torah, you divide it in little portions and you read the whole Torah in one year. And then at the end of the year, which is in a few weeks, we finish it. Uh, and then you start again. But the Palestinian Torah was to divide it in three or three and a half years. And then you read the whole Torah in sev twice in seven years. That means that the portions are a lot smaller. Um, so you would go to one synagogue, they're on a different schedule than the other one, right? Saadia Gaon, now we're talking about the hero of the week. Saadia Gaon, he was born in Fayum, uh, which is in Egypt as you see, in 882, quite a while ago. Um, according to Jewish tradition, Fayum is the same uh, thing as in the Bible, the, name, the city, Pitom, Fayum, Payum, Pitom, who knows? It's a bit of a stretch, but that's the tradition. A town mentioned in the Bible as one of the cities that the Hebrew slaves built for Pharaoh. So he called himself the Pitomite, basically, as if he believed that that was the city that he lived in. When Saadi was only 20 years old, he wrote a Hebrew dictionary in two versions, one by the first letter of the words, a second by the last letter of the words as a tool for poets. Have you ever seen a, a dictionary where you look up the word by the last letter? That'll, that's fun. And to be a good tool for, a, are you looking for a, a word that rhymes with uh, ostentatious? Um, Asius, Asius. Uh, so you look, I don't know by now. So um, you look it up in the dictionary, everything that ends with Asius, okay. Yeah? In a, in a later stage, he also wrote an Ar Arabic translation. Yeah, so explaining the word in Arabic, because everybody spoke Arabic at the time, right? Everybody uh, at home. So now, but still, Hebrew is your holy language. Now you want to write poetry in your own holy language in Hebrew. But you also want to know what the word means, so then you can look up the meaning in Arabic. Of course, all in Hebrew letters. We know that from a young age, Saadia was very interested in poetry, even though not much of his poetry has survived. 
In his dictionaries, he presents Biblical Hebrew in new applications, adapting it to be used in contemporary and future poetry. This parallels the same phenomenon in Arabic and, and is no doubt inspired by it. Arabs see the language of the Quran as the purest form of Arabic and poetry written in that idiom is celebrated and highly popular. Saadi wanted to show that classical Hebrew had the same poetic beauty and capacities. Yeah. Everybody gets that? Is that understood? Is that simple? Okay. And this is going to be um, uh, soon, a whole class on, uh, on, on Hebrew poetry. That is... Uh, inspired by Arabic poetry. There's a whole genre, very influential, but this is the beginning. As far as we know, there's nothing else. So I just actually trying to present Hebrew and make it adaptable to a type of poetry that is parallel to Arabic poetry. So it's a whole, it's a different style of poetry, but we're going to talk about that next time. Um, uh, you can read this one too. At the age of 23, he wrote a po polemic book against the Korites and the entitled Esa Mishali. Yeah. Let me take out my discourse. That's what it's called. It's actually, I found a book of uh, a book, a photo of Karaite community before uh, Second World War. There was a big community in Egypt. So I thought this was an appropriate uh, photo. Okay, let's go to Christina. Would you like to read a bit? Okay. At the end of the Esa Mishali, Saadia presents a poem of which a large section is preserved. The poem follows the Hebrew alphabet. The first strophe is centered around the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, Aleph. The second strophe around the second letter, Bet, etc. Every strophe has four lines. Each, each line consists of two units. Yeah. So eight units in total. Each line begins and ends with the central letter of that specific stroke. Each unit has the same end rhyme, except the very last unit, which rhymes with all other units. So it sounds a bit complicated, but I'm gonna give two examples. This is uh, the letter Yud, which you see the, the red. I hope there's nobody colorblind here, then it's a bit harder to see. But the beginning of every half verse starts with the same letter. So I have them all in red, see? And except for the last part, because all the last parts of every letter rend, uh, rhyme with each other. So um, I will, does anyone that's very fluid in Hebrew wants to read this? So for the sound of it, not that you can read it, but anyone? Okay, I'll do it. Yeket kashti v'telyi, a'ad ma'ad adyi, yanub tub piryi, le'yater goyi, so the last one, so you see that everything, it's a very um, intense rhyme, with, uh, the, 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 the rhyme pattern appears almost every breath, and uh, just the, the last one is, uh, is uh, different because that. Goes with so, and that is also very similar to certain Arabic rhymes, by the way. It's parallel to that. Now, um, what's also interesting, let's just look at the translation. Would you like to read uh, the translation, Christina? In the light of my bow and my arrow, I will dress in my beautiful garment, taking profit from my good fruit for the remnant of my people. Yithre is my Levite. Yer Yerudun is the hand of my desire. Yossi and Yanai are my beauty, like those in charge of treasures. Now you see all these uh, parentheses, but meaning he uses a lot of quotes from biblical parts, so biblical expressions, and that becomes a very typical uh, phenomenon. You, they knew, people uh, throughout the ages had almost memorized the entire Bible, which is a huge, huge work, and uh, and they knew all these particular expressions and used them in the poetry, not only to use classical language, but there's also all these um, references that if people know the Bible, they say, oh, that is this and that is the context. And how does he use it in a new, in a new way? So a bow and arrow is, um, that, is uh, 
that is uh, that that's from from Genesis, as you see. And then there's a part from Job, um, which is a whole different part of the Bible, etc., etc. Yathrai uh, and Yudutun are Levites who were in charge of the of tra who were appointed over the temple. And um, and why is that? Because um, he he uses. And he uses them also as a, as a metaphor for, for things. You have to remember, this is a book, and this is a polemic against Karaites. So um, bow and arrow then also stands for Mishnah and uh, Gemara, for instance. And uh, I dress my beautiful garment is the Talmudic tradition, and which the Karaites uh, do not follow. Um, but now I had underlined in blue, Yossi and Yanai. And why, and I picked this strophe particularly because this means something to you. Christina, what does it mean to you? Only part of it. Yossi, you don't know. But who is Janai? You I don't, don't remember? I don't remember, but we discussed it in class. Very good. At least you remember the name. Okay. So Janai was a poet who wrote for, remember, it is a, in Bible, uh, Byzantine Jews before the advent of Islam, that was in the Palestinian tradition. He actually enhanced the, the liturgy, the prayers, by adding poems. So there you go with Yanai. He said, this is my beauty. He's taking these, these uh, and Yossi is another poet, that he is actually using as saying, look, this is, these people were uh, beautifying the liturgy and I'm doing the same thing. They are in charge of treasures. I mean, the treasures are the treasures of rabbinic Judaism. And, and so, because Yanai did use a lot of themes from rabbinic Judaism. And so, um, so this is both a praise of poetry, a praise of beautification, a praise of the Hebrew language, but also a praise of rabbinic, uh, of the rabbinite uh, tradition. Yeah? Amy, are you here? Yes. I'll give you the next slide then. Okay, um, I, I'll read the Hebrew first. So this is the second example that I have, the letter Lama, the, the L. And you see in red again, it ends and begins with the L all the time. Lo le lo lehim su u hallel ahole shamai vihilel le tahto la kol golel libromat kol polel lo lachem et holel mistolel la erev yumolel aharit rishaim nichrata. So again, uh, a break of the pattern in the last uh, in the last unit, and as a little hillel hallel hallel hillel. A lot of uh, alliteration, right? Now you could, uh, if you don't mind, read uh, for us the translation. Okay. Send praise to him, to God, O tents of Shammai and Hillel, to the one who spins the entire earth beneath him and decrees everything in heaven above. Do not become alarmed by him that twists. By evening he will be weakened. The end of the wicked is cut off. Yeah. Now, once again, if this is a polemic against the Karaites, then the wicked are the Karaites have to say people in uh, history were not very politically uh, correct and were not very inclusive. It was, I am right and you are wrong. And you see that from both sides. There's also, um, I forgot who it is, but there it could be a commission, I'm not 100% sure, a Karaite who wrote a whole long poem. And the poem is all curses of Sadiq on. So it goes back and forth. He, uh, he, uh, he, because Saudi Gon wrote against the Karaites, they then also write against him. So uh, it's back and forth. You see that with a lot of people. Like, uh, if you disagree, uh, now I hope we will say, if you disagree, most people, I hope, will say, well, I respectfully disagree and I understand your point, but this is how I see it. They would say, this guy is stu more stupid than the end of an ass, because I am obviously right. That's what, how people talked in those days. Unfortunately, look, there, I believe in evolution of humankind, and, um, and it took a while, but I think we are sometimes in a, in a better place. So take that in mind once again. No uh, presentism. Uh, we have to, uh, that was the culture, you know, can I say? So ha we should not only have understanding for people of other cultures today, also for other cultures in the past. That's also inclusive. Okay. Do not be alarmed by him that twists. Yeah, he's talking about Karaites. By evening he will be weakened and the end the wicked is cut off. He takes, he takes a text from the Psalms. And the Psalms uh, obviously um, didn't talk about Karaites, but uh, he takes it uh, in, a, in a new context. Now, 
O test of Shemayin Hillel. Do you by any chance know who that, who, what Shemayin Hillel, what that stands for, Amy? I'm not, absolutely not upset if you don't, because I would be just very surprised if you did, but that's fine. No, I don't have any idea. Okay. So, um, Sylvia, tell me who, who Shemayin Hillel. There were two rabbis during the time of the Emoraim that always disagreed with each other, and then they two, they built two kind of followings, and they always disagreed with each other throughout history. Yeah, so opposing schools of, th of thinking within Judaism. Uh, actually, they were Tanaim, or maybe even before that, but their, but their schools and their followers, uh, um, I'm not sure even in the time of the Amoraim, but so praise sent to God, O tens of Shammai and Hillel, that stands for the entire uh, rabbinic tradition. And once again, yeah, this, part, this fits in the polemic. Uh, very good. So Amy, we'll go to the next slide. At this time, he also moved to Tiberias to further his studies. Yeah, by the way, I am so happy that I presented a bit of his poetry because for years I knew that a, a, a style of poetry called, that I call Andalusian poetry started with him, but I didn't have any of his poetry and I was looking for years, sometimes, and I just recently found it. So I added this last night and I'm very pleased that I could show you some of his poetry. So it's not just a little footnote. I want you to know how pleased and happy and excited I am to have to, uh, to present this to you. This is, a, this is a, a premiere for you guys, the first one who have seen that. Okay, yes? In the year 922, Sadia took sides in an ongoing calendar conflict. During the times of the Second Temple, the new month had always been announced after the sighting of the new moon. In other words, the Jewish lunar calendar used to be determined by observation. By the way, Karaites still do that. Uh, you know about Karaites, right? I have this uh, Facebook friend uh, and um, he had a problem because, look, all the Jewish uh, holidays, all, almost all of them, are in the, in the middle of the month. So there's plenty of time to have seen that the moon is there and then you can figure out when the holiday is. But Rosh Hashanah, which was this weekend, started Friday evening, is the first day of the month. So how do you see the moon and then know for sure? Maybe the moon is covered with clouds and how can you see? And so Karaites nowadays, they, um, they, they, they observe the moon and then they, have, they post a photo of the moon that they see on the internet and people look on the computer to see if the moon was sighted and then they know the calendar. That's how it works now with Karaites. But he said, yeah, he didn't want to use his computer on a day that might be Rosh Hashanah, he wasn't sure, but then the right before and ever, he, he, but in any case, this is an issue. Uh, imagine before the time of computers, even much harder. After? After a setting was verified, the new month was then proclaimed by various signals. So one of them is the shofar. And that's probably the, you see the shofar, that's that horn, that ram's horn, or, this is probably the horn of a gazelle here. Uh, that is pr probably the reason, one of the reasons why on Rosh Hashanah, this, this, uh, yesterday, uh, the, the, the tradition is to blow on a ram's horn. It's, it's connected to that. Okay, so you see the, the moon, right? Everybody knows the stages of the moon. And so the first sliver, that's, that's the, the determining factor of the beginning of the moon. According to Jewish law, Amy. According to Jewish law, the communities outside of Israel were not allowed to follow their own observations. Sightings had to be established by the Sanhedrin, yeah. a religious council in Jerusalem. Therefore, communities outside of Palestine were necessarily dependent on calculations. After the Sanhedrin had ceased to exist, the appearance of the new moon was calculated in every place of the world, both inside and outside the land of Israel. So they didn't move to uh, say, now we're going to just allow observations everywhere. That would have been another option, no. The decision was calculation everywhere. Mm -hmm. This switchover happened in the year 359. And as you, I already explained, the Karaites went the other way. They said no observation everywhere. Yeah. yeah. The calendar conflict took place when, when the Gaon in Israel, Aaron ben Meir, 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 who had his residence in the town of Ram Ramla, issued a certain adjustment to the calculation procedure. The Babylonian community were not about to follow this new procedure. As a result, the two communities ended up celebrating Pesach, Pesach, which is a Passover, two days apart. To make it 
even more complicated in Israel. There are not only Palestinian Jews, but also Babylonian Jews who follow the instructions of the Babylonian Geonim. Ge yeah, so if you have all the Palestinian Jews living in Palestine and the Babylonians Jews in Babylon, it's not so disturbing because you know, everybody around you does the same thing. And who knows, <coughs> in, far, <coughs> in far away Eastern, you know, you don't see it. There's no, uh, there's no communication. Who knows what they do there? That's a different world. But now one community in the same street will celebrate the holiday one day and then the other community, your neighbors, belong to the other synagogue and they follow two days apart. And that becomes a bit problematic, as you can imagine. When Saadia got involved, he did not just humbly express his opinion. He wrote a treatise on Jewish calendar in support of the Babylonian position, which he called Safir Hamo Khadin Ha. The Book of Seasons. He yeah, the Book of Seasons is a bit easier, but Sefer Hamo Adim in Hebrew, if you want to be correct. Yeah. He dedicated this book to the Babylonian uh, extra lark David the David Ben the Zakai. Zakai. Simultaneously, he issued a warning to the Palestinian Goan. So that's another example of that, that attitude that used to uh, that before modernity. <clears throat> Um, saying, uh, you could say, you could write a book, in, in our opinion, dedicating uh, a book to one of the parties, but to then mudsling and issue a warning to the palace, go on, you should know your place and you should listen to the people in Babylonia. That goes a bit far, especially for somebody who's neither a ga a gaon uh, nor an axolarch. What, what is his authority? He's a young whippersnapper and he is issuing a warning to the Palestinian Gaon, that is, yeah, that would cause some uh, controversy. Yeah. Makaya, is Makaya here? Hello. Hello, Makaya. Good, you're loud and clear. This position made Sa'adia very popular in Babylonia. As a result, the exilarch ben, David Ben Zakai decided to offer him the position of Gaon. This was a big deal. Never before had anyone from outside Babylonia had been appointed as Gaon. In doing so, Ben Zakai went against his advisor, Nassim Narawani. Narawani, that, yeah, that's a very tough word to read, but you do a great job. Thank you. Who believed that Sa'adia had too much of an antagonistic personality. Sure enough, soon after Sa'adia became Sa'adia Gaon. He became he a Gaon, right? Conflict. That's why he's called Sa'adia Gaon. Uh huh. He ended up in a conflict with Ben David Ben Sakai. Saadia refused to sign something that the exilarch had decided. The conflict very soon exploded. Both parties declared each other invalid. Yeah. Yeah. Listen to this. The exilarch appointed another Gaon to replace Saadia. This took place in the year 930. Saadia's move, he appointed another exilarch. Now that is Pulling so unbelievable. It's like saying, um, like say, okay, you know, uh, our current president uh, has the habit of uh, firing people. Let's say he has an advisor and he fires the, and he fires the advisor. Now the advisor says, okay, I'm going to appoint another president. That is like crazy. It's not impossible. But but Saadia did that. He's like he's supposed to work under the exilarch. He's fired. Oh, he just appoints another exilarch. It's just amazing. It's almost funny. Uh huh. Polemic works were written back and forth. Yeah, so interesting stuff. Yeah. Finally, in 937, there was a reconciliation between the two, and Saadia was reinstated. Did they live happy, happily ever after? Not very long. In 940, David Ben Zakai passed away. And two years later, Saadia Gaon died as well. So during this, uh, his uh, career is a lot of just fighting and uh, conflict, unfortunately. Uh, although he just is very prolific in his, uh, and influential in his work anyway. Mm -hmm. Besides his previously mentioned dictionary and his book of seasons, Saadia Gaon wrote many important works. Among these, the oldest existing Jewish prayer book, before all prayers were said by heart. In fact, there is an earlier one by Rabbi Amran Gaon, died in 875, but there are so many different, there are so many differently edited versions that it is impossible to reconstruct the original.
yeah so there is an older one but everybody just added they, they used it the different communities used it and whenever that tradition is different they change things so there's all these different versions there's, there's no way to figure out what rabbi amram Gaon really wrote so we have an older one but also we don't have it because it's unrecognizable and for Saadi Gaon, his prayer book is still recognizable. Now, it's written in Arabic, which is interesting, in Hebrew, Jewish prayer book in Arabic, but he doesn't write down all the prayers. He just says, you say this psalm, and he just says the first words of the psalm so they know what it is. But in Arabic, he says, after this, you are right, and then the first Hebrew words of the psalm. And that's how he just explains what you say first and last. It's not a prayer book in our day where everything is written out. Okay, Gesad Gaon also made an Arabic Bible translation. Not the whole Bible, it's, uh, it's big, and he didn't do the whole thing. But uh, he, the whole Torah, the whole Pentateuch, five books of the Torah he covered. The book of Isaiah, which is big. He did all the Psalms. The book of Job, Proverbs, the Song of Songs. The book of Ruth, Lamentations, Ecclesiastes, the book of Esther, and the book of Daniel. And, but uh, he wrote it. This is not a good book because this is from Saadia, I don't know. Yes, but this only on the right side, you only see Hebrew and the small letters is Aramaic. But he actually did Hebrew, Aramaic, Arabic, Hebrew, Aramaic, Arabic, every line separately. I should take a photo of it and then post that. I have a printed version of it. So uh, actually, yeah, it's printed. Good. Is Nicholas there? Yeah, I'm here. Nicholas, welcome. Hello. Hi. Uh, would you uh, like to read something for us? Yeah. I, I will take care of the weird words, okay? All right. His best known work is written in Judeo uh, Arabic, 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 under the Judeo name, Arabic, Arabic, under the name Kitab al Amanat wal Iatiqadat, Book of Beliefs and Opinions, later translated into Hebrew as Sefer Emunot wa Deot. Okay. But Book of Beliefs and Opinions is what we're going to use it from here on, okay? Yeah. In his book, Sadia is the first Jewish thinker since antiquity, antiquity yeah. to present a combination of Jewish thought and philosophy. He does that in the style of a, a philosophical movement called ka Kalam. Kalam, also called Mu'tazila, but we forget that word. Kalam really is, became a term for philosophy in Arabic, in uh, meaning philosophy in general, and the specific type of Kalam, i.e. philosophy, it's actually called Mu'tazila, but uh, that is too hard of a word to just say Kalam. The Kalam movement originated among Muslims who had discovered the works of Greek philosophers such as Plato and Aristotle after they had been translated into Arabic by Byzantine Christians. Soon enough, Kalam philosophy was picked up by Jewish thinkers as well. Yeah. Uh, one of the main beliefs among the Kalam philosophers was that our... Faculty of Reason, in Greek logos, is a God-given tool to find truth, just as prophecy or other forms of revelation. Therefore, as true revelation and true reason both come from God, they cannot be in conflict, but should both lead to the same truth. And that means the two should be used together, and they should correct each other, which is, look, there's plenty of people who say, no, only reason, I don't believe in revelation, in our day and age. Uh, that is probably very common. But you have to remember that in those days, there's a lot of people who say, no, I only believe in revelation. I don't believe in reason. If uh, I get a message from God or our ancestors have got a message from God and I look around me and it seems to be contrary to the truth, I ignore uh, what my reason tells me. I just only believe revelation. Um, and, and so revelation... Even if you believe in revelation, revelation can be interpreted if God says uh, revelation. You know what revelation is, right? That from outside you get, let's say, a divine inspiration and it tells you some, some, something that's supposedly true. Let's say uh, revelation, you would see the light and there's a dream and an angel comes to you. So that would be revelation. That's outside information from outside of this world. And the angel tells you your soul is immortal. Or something right that could be a revelation now how do you interpret that first of all what is your definition of a soul uh what is uh immortal does it mean 
it doesn't die by its own, but it can still be killed. Or just, you know, there's still there's still always um, interpretation possible. And this might not have been a good example, but oh, another one. God created the world. Okay, so that is revelation. Does it mean he created it um, overnight? Or does it mean he used evolution? So if you say, no, I believe it's created overnight in just one poof. God said, let there be a universe. And then there was a universe already, just in five minutes. Or, um, and that's what I believe. But that's an interpretation. Maybe he, he created it using all the things that you see through reason that, uh, there's a, that there were millions that God wasn't in a hurry and he has all the time of the world and he took his time and, uh, the, and the world was created through a whole process of millions of years. So one would go against reason, one would maybe jive with how our reason now perceives things based on research and science. Now, if revelation and reason should say the same thing, then reason should probably, to some extent, dictate the way you would interpret your revelation. Do you follow what I'm saying? I think so, right? Not too crazy. Okay. Yes, continue, please, uh, Nicholas. All right. Um, God sent prophets with a divine message, revelation to guide people on the right and truthful path. Believers followed these instructions without understanding the wisdom wisdom behind it. So that's what he said. So that, that's his idea. Uh, that's what the ideas of columnists are. He, they say the prophets didn't really un necessarily understand the words. They got the words, but the right interpretation and understanding, it's not necessarily that they had that. They just gave us some truths and thank God that we have this truth because it would take us so many generations to figure it out through science and we had a shortcut. But, mm -hmm. um, according to Kalam thinkers, this blindly following um, should be a first step. Now it is our duty not just to obey without questioning, but to strive for a deeper understanding of this uh, revealed truth using our intellectual faculties reason so not just accepting it blindly but also trying to use your god-given brain and try to understand uh what it is uh, the truth found through reason should bring you to the same insights as the truth of revelation the torah according to jews and the quran uh, according to muslims now they, they can go both ways you can say um aha uh -huh. you could say um uh, I'm going to use reason to interpret my, the, my, my, my source of information through revelation. But you can also say, I'm going to use reason to argue for the truth of my revelation, right? Um, or you could say, I'm using revelation to interpret the reason. So you can still have different ways of, of, of balancing the two. But, um, but it's a great innovation. I think it's, a, it's, it's an amazing thing that Adya Gaon embraced this, as the Gaon is one of the most important leaders of Judaism. And um, that, that, that's uh, really uh, very interesting. Although the way he does it uh, could be criticized sometimes, but it's definitely revolutionary or a big step, or evolutionary, I should say. I like that better. Yes, um, Alex, you said your mic was repaired. So we'll give you another shot. All right. The Kalem movement attracted Muslims, Jews, Christians, Zoroastrians, and others. There were even mixed study groups of intellectuals from different religious backgrounds that discussed philosophical topics together. This was not to everyone's liking. During Sahadid's lifetime, a Muslim theologian from Spain wrote about an experience he had during his visit to Baghdad. Yeah, this is also a great find, and I, I had to put this in. This is amazing. Okay, please read. Yes, I attended twice, but I refused to go there for a third time for the following simple reason. At the first meeting, not only virtuous Islamic sects... No, very. Present, sorry. I thought you said virtuous, but that could mean by my lack of hearing. Sorry. Not only various Islamic sects were present, but also unbelievers... Zoroastrians, atheists, Jews, and Christians, in short, unbelievers of all kinds. Yeah, he, 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 he gathers uh, all, all these people are, he calls all unbelievers. Uh -huh. One of these unbelievers wrote and said to the assembly, 
We are meeting here for a discussion. Its conditions are known to all. You, Muslims, are not allowed to argue from your books and prophetic traditions since we deny both. Everyone, therefore, has to limit themselves to rational arguments. The whole assembly applauded these words. So you can imagine that after these words, I decided to withdraw. Isn't that so funny? Look, he's shocked. This is a culture shock. They were so woke in, uh, in, in Baghdad that they uh, accepted everybody, respected everybody's religion. And so it makes sense. If you want to discuss with among Zoroastrians and, and non-Muslims and Christians together, you, have to, you can only discuss based on, a, uh, on the common ground, on common things that you, uh, re- that you depend on. Now, reason, everybody, uh, according to Alam, everybody thought that reason was a valid way to discuss things. Right? That's valid information that God gives us. But revelation, they, dis- they, they, they do not accept. So uh, Jews believe in the Torah as a source of pure revelation. But Muslims believe that the Torah was given, but it was tampered with, as we saw. That's the, uh, the, uh, the dogma of Tahrir, right? Um, Christians believe that the Torah was changed and replaced by the New Testament, so to say, by the gospel. So everybody has a different source of revelation. So you can, if you start saying, uh, using your source of revelation as an argument, you're not going to get anywhere together. So it's better to leave that out. Supposedly reason is a uh, valid source of information according to everybody. So you, so you limit yourself to that. But uh, this person says, no, what, what? these non-believers are telling us we cannot use our, our Quran. So he's like, he, he, he left it. It's, it's an amazing little piece of information about what was going on in those days, isn't it? Okay, Sadia Gaon, Alex? Sadia Gaon, in addition to the two pillars of Kalam, reason, and revelation, adds a third, Talumic, ta- Talmudic tradition. Yes, yeah, a Jewish tradition, but uh, uh, based on the, on the Talmud, as we spoke about the Talmud as a, as a, big, as a source of Jewish thought. So he has uh, reason and scripture, but then also uh, authority, authoritarian tradition, basically a tradition that has an authority, basically a, a solid tradition. But of course, that is different from the Karai Jews, right? They only have reason and revelation. They don't have, they don't believe in the in the in the in the, in the authority of tradition. Yeah. One more. An important premise of the Kalam movement was that God is just. This seems an obvious religious assumption, but the conclusions that the Kalamists drew from this premise were not so self-obvious. For example, this necessarily oh, implies yeah. this for them, this necessarily implied that a person must have free will. So how does God adjust mean free will? You'll find out. In addition, a human must have the ability to act on that free will. Yeah, the Arabic word for ability or power is qadr. Uh-huh. Without free free agency, God would control all man's actions, which in in which case humans would not bear responsibility for them. So let, let's say if all the power is with God, He has the power. He's all powerful, right? It's called omnipotent in a fancy word. And if that is, if you take that absolutely, that means we have no power. So as humans. That means we don't have free will. I mean, you can will whatever you want. You can have the will to want something, but you don't have the power to act upon it. And there is a, was a discussion. Discussion. God is all, almighty. He's powerful, all powerful, omnipotent, uh, supposedly. But maybe not, because he must have given people some power also. He have, must have shared his power with, with humans. And so, because we can do things. Look, if I decide to, um, I don't want to deal with these students anymore, I'm going to stop, right? That changes the course of history because you don't have a teacher anymore, you cannot finish this class. I'm changing the, the world, I'm changing the future just by making a decision. And uh, Hunter has to come up with a solution and find uh, another, another teacher that takes over, right? So, uh, did, did, I, I, did, are you going to say, maybe you, uh, 
don't get a certain um, credit, and then you you could actually miss. That could change some one of your or, or your entire uh, how do you say um, course in 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 Hunter because you now decide on a whole different course of action and and a study path everything I could make one decision and you could make one decision and that could have a chain of reaction so there is an influence that I have in my decision but if you say no it's all God's will God did everything God has everything in His hand. As was a, as a go- old gospel song, he's got the whole world in his hand. That means we have nothing in our hands. So how does that relate? Is God all powerful? And look, you don't have to be religious to have this re- discussion. There are secular people who are not religious that, that debate up to today. Do people really have free will or, um, or are we just a, we doing everything that's dictated either by our genes, our DNA, or by our makeup, or, and by our, or by our uh, nurturing, our environment. And if that is true, then can we be punished? Can, can, can a criminal be thrown in jail for doing something bad, but it's really his brains and his hormones and his environment that, that, that forced him almost to do these things? Is he really responsible now? This is exactly the same uh, conversation. I should let you read more. Um. In such a scenario, it would be un- unjust or unjust for God to mete out reward and punishment. Yeah, if God is really omnipotent to the point that we have no color, we have no ability to act upon it, and we, if we believe in the reward and punishment, and that is a premise of, uh, of, of most religions, that there is a consequence to our action, but that would be unjust if we, if we are not responsible for our actions. Yes, please read. After the 10th century Kalam, uh, harmonizing religion with logic began to decline in Islam and was eventually considered heretical by most Muslim scholars. However, it continued in Jewish circles and the Arabic world centuries much- Oh, centuries longer, sorry centuries longer than islam yeah one concept that became taboo was that humans have quidar the ability to act upon free will according to the according to later teachings of orthodox islam god alone has qadar positive yeah so um yeah that's a a bit of a hard one but it's choosing to say we're not going to say that humans have uh have independent uh have independent uh, ability uh, and power to decide uh, the life and to actually change the world accordingly because it takes it away from God and we believe God is almighty and we just have to have that awe that, that God is in charge. But uh, that was a choice that was made. And look, that is Orthodox Islam. I'm sure that uh, individual Muslims uh, uh, to a certain extent may, may uh, think differently. This is just one uh, one little slide I wanted to give us background information. Just read these little letters. Abdullah Hamiduddin. Abdullah Hamiduddin. You thought, say A-H, it's fine. Yeah. A-H thought <laughs> Kalam in Saudi Arabia, taught Kalam in Saudi Arabia. His students were arrested and he became a refugee in Great Britain. Yeah, I hear there's a change going on and there's parties in, front, in favor of the change and others are against the change. But this is before there was any change. And so um, it was forbidden to teach Kalam and he was actually... Uh, but they were, the people were arrested, so it's very hard. I met him a few times. Very kind, kind person. Okay, so they go on now on free will. So we go to the book of beliefs and opinions, and now we're going to see what does he say. And unfortunately, we're already running out of time, and I have so much more to do. I, mean, I should really divide this class into two and, and have two classes on him. You know what? You know what we do? We, we'll, we'll just go back on this space. I'm not going to rush. And I can move the schedule uh, around the curriculum a bit, and we could actually go on this a little longer. Maybe that's a really good idea, because I think it's valuable to talk about these concepts in depth and not rush through them, right? I think it's us- useful. Okay, Kevin, you, your, uh, your um, mic was fixed. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. All uh, right. From Treatise 4, Obedience, Rebellion, Predestination and Divine Justice, Chapter 7, 
it is in keeping with the justice of the creator that he gave man the power and ability to execute what he had commanded him and to refrain from what he had forbidden him. This is evident from the argument of reason as well as from scripture. So if you believe in divine revelation um, and there are commandments and there are prohibitions, it would be totally nonsensical to tell people do this or don't do that if they cannot, don't have free will to decide and to, to actually abide by these words. If, um, if, if you say to your child, um, do not pull the cat by its tail. That hurts. And, um, but the, the, the little brat finds it funny that the cat says, Meow! so he keeps pulling the cat by the tail. So, but if he has no free will, he could say, but daddy, God is almighty. He made me do it. I mean, right. So you cannot punish him. Or it's just, just blame God on it. So um, that, that doesn't make any sense. Okay. Yeah. As far as reason is concerned, it demands that the all the all wise would not command anyone to do something that is not in his ability and which he is un, un, unable to fulfill. Yeah. So if God says do this and he cannot do it. That's unreasonable. Now, is this pure reason? It's still connected to, it's still mingled with uh, revelation because you still are assuming that there is a, a God who actually gives commandment. So it's not, not naked reason. It's not, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a mingling of, uh, a mi reason here is mixed with uh, revelation, but um, it is a rational, it's a form of rational thinking. Yes. As for scripture is found in statements like, but they that wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. So strength would be translatable into Arabic as qadr, as meaning being able, able to, to act on something. It's not that you're a helpless pawn in the chessboard that God is playing. Yeah. Furthermore, a person cannot be considered as the agent of an act unless he exercises freedom of choice in performing it. No one can be held accountable for an act if he does not possess freedom of choice and cannot exercise his choice. Yeah, so there, are, there was a school of thought that says, yeah, you have free will, you can will whatever you want, and that alone, just wanting the right, do the right thing, that is what you get rewards for. But in order to act upon your, your will, that is up to God. So you're not responsible for your actions. You're only responsible for your intentions. And uh, so Adil Golan says that also doesn't make sense. You're not, uh, you are accountable for your actions, basically. And we know that because, uh, because uh, if, if you, um, let's say if you steal, you have to pay a penalty for stealing. The penalty is not for wanting to steal, for the intention to steal. The, you can have an intention. I, I want to um, do something really bad today, right? But you, but you, but you don't act upon it. You're, you're not going to be punished for it. So it's really the actions and not the intentions, right? The Creator, magnified by His Majesty, does not in any way interfere with the actions of men and does not force them in any way, either to obey or to disobey Him. Yeah. So uh, actions of men. I mean, this is. We would now say the actions of people. Um, the question is, did he really think that only men have free will and women don't? Probably not. It, this is a way of, uh, in many languages, man means uh, the masculine form stands for everything. And uh, only women have a, uh, feminine has a, has a uh, specific form uh, grammatically. Uh, but if you use the masculine form, it stands for the general, basically, for it, for he and she. So if you say men, it just stands for people. It's not the way we talk now. But once again, we should take that in the context uh, of those days. And it's, but they, they, to be honest, also, it's true that people also big part in antiquity, for sure. And also a big chunk of the, of the Middle Ages didn't think that women were on the same level intellectually and emotionally 
Um, so um, unfortunately, it's, we cannot change that. But uh, this is not the case necessarily here. So, but sometimes that might come up. We'll see. We'll see. Luckily, we learn right over. I believe very strong believer in in. Uh, I I I don't believe in revolution. There's always blood and there's always violence. A revolution, always a a kickback because people react back the other opposite. But evolution, little steps forward, eventually gets us really far. And I th I, I'm very promote component of of. Um, of uh, evolution. The whole thing of this class is evolving our insights, evolving our, our, um, our wisdom, hopefully, and our intelligence, and it's from training our brain and trying to be, be sensitive to each other. We're studying here with people from different uh, uh, backgrounds, different religions, and this is all helpful in uh, an evolution. I, it's a wonderful thing. Okay, I believe in it very strongly. Okay, sorry for this blab, blabbing. Please continue. If God were to exercise force, there would be no <laughs> sense to his commands and or prohibitions. Also, if God were to force a person to perform some act, it would not be proper for him to punish him for it. Yeah, if, if really God is in charge and he makes me do it, how would he punish? Would that be fair? So this all comes from the premise, God is just. Now you see how God is just is directly connected to the notion of free will because if he punishes things uh, a person for something that he's himself is responsible for that's an unjust god should be punished instead god forbid okay god god forbid right okay yeah if people acted out out of compulsion then both the believer and the infidel would have to be rewarded since both were would be doing what is requested of them it is like a person who employs two worksmen. They first to build the first to build and the other to tear down. He would be obliged to pay each of them for their wage. Yeah, so he forces this person to sin because he is in charge, so he makes him sin, and the other person to do the right thing. Now it's not that you have a good person and a bad person. They both do what God wants and they show both should be uh, rewarded. So it's a very interesting way of thinking out of the box. It's, it's probably very daring. We, we think, why we, maybe some people might think, why are you studying Sadiq? Oh, I'm a med medieval philosopher who believes in God and God being almighty, this and that. It's so outdated. No, this is very, well, I, I'm not going to say if it's outdated or not. For some people, it depends. But look, this is daring thought, even to say that God would be obliged to pay each, uh, the sinner and the good person their wage. This might have been taken as so offensive. Uh, almost blasphemous to say these things even it really wakes you up and whoa what are we actually saying when God has the whole world in his hands do we really believe that but if it's not are we really partially responsible of where the world goes and so it's very much wait and a wake-up call you know, you, you know what I'm saying is this this is now a new topic and our time is up I think it's wonderful. I'm so happy we could go more depth into Sa'adi Ga'on's thought. It's not just Sa'adi Ga'on, but it's the, this whole movement of Kalam and um, putting reason into religion. Wonderful. And I'm happy that uh, this class went out of hand and we're going to go continue uh, on Thursday with Sa'adi Ga'on.